Uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, welcome here at the Chamber of Labor for the 23rd Wiener Stadtgespräch. It's a privilege for me to welcome the speaker of this evening, uh, Sir Tony Atkinson. Uh, let me first briefly set the stage for tonight's conversation. The Wiener Stadtgespräch is a cooperation with the weekly magazine Falter and the TV station Okto, which will broadcast this event on February the 23rd, uh, 8 p.m. We are appreciating this uh, cooperation as it um, makes it possible to discuss uh, questions of economic and uh, society. Um, which are up to date uh, and to dis discuss these questions with a broad audience uh, like tonight. So thank you all for being here. Uh, the distribution of income and wealth has not been uh, in the center of political and economic discussion in the last two decades. These were the decades of unbridled money making on financial markets. But the crisis has forced us to face the close connection between the financial crisis and inequality. Firstly, the increase in inequality is now understood to have been a major cause of this crisis. Too much people, too much money, sorry, has, to, uh, has been in the hands of uh, people with too high savings rates and too risky attitudes in financial investment. And secondly, the social consequences of the financial crisis and the austerity uh, policy in Europe are devastating. Poverty, underemployment and social exclusion uh, in, are increasing in a rich society. So, uh, as a result, we are in the midst of an economic crisis and at the beginning of a deep social crisis uh, in Europe. The political response on the European level so far has been very disappointing and on many issues even went in the wrong direction. Therefore, there is an increasing urgency uh, to finally turn the political attention towards the distribution of wealth, income, jobs, and life prospects. Professor Atkinson is the economist who is renowned uh, the world over for bringing income distribution in from the cold. He has done extensive research on the causes, the development, and the consequences of inequality. And tonight, he will point to ways out of economic crisis and social inequality. So I'm looking forward to a fascinating evening. And uh, let me now hand over to Rosa Lyon, who is working for the main news program of the Austrian television, Zeit im Bild. She will lead us through the evening and conduct the conversation uh, with Tony Atkinson. Rosa and Tony, thanks again for being with us tonight. And the floor is yours. Nowadays, politicians, since the crisis is here, talk about inequality and they talk about uh, income distribution. They do that in Austria, but they do that around the world. Uh, Barack Obama, for example, the President of the United States, did that yesterday. Uh, Christine Lagarde, the head of the International Monetary Fund, did it a couple of weeks ago. Sir Tony Atkinson has focused his research on income distribution and inequality for many, many years. And he built a scientific foundation for the political discussions that are going on right now. I will, of course, ask him uh, quite some political questions tonight. But first, let's hear him talk about the scientific background, please. So, uh, schönen guten Abend. Und ich muss mich zuerst entschuldigen, dass ich nicht mich auf Deutsch heute Abend ausdrücke. Ich habe Deutsch in Hamburg gelernt, aber es war jetzt war lange her. Und es war im 60er Jahren, Anfang des 60er Jahren. Und, und seitdem habe ich 
feel for that. So I must continue in English, but I hope I will understand the questions. In fact, I'd like to start with the early 1960s. I was a young student of mathematics in Cambridge, and I decided to change direction and to switch to studying social science. And I did it, I think, because I was concerned that I perceived the world to be one which was, in many respects, unfair and unjust. So when I began as an academic economist, uh, I decided to research on the subject of poverty and inequality. And my first book, published in 1969, was called Poverty in Britain and the Reform of Social Security. Now, at that time, very few economists were interested in inequality. There was, in fact, a small group in Cambridge led by James Mead, a group which actually included Joe Stiglitz, of whom you may have heard, and Partha de Scupta and several others who've contributed so much to economics. Now, today, the situation is very different. People seem, indeed, to have woken up to the pervasiveness of inequality and its profound impacts on our societies. It's in the newspaper headlines. It's the subject of events like this evening. And, as has just been said, that uh, world leaders have recognized this. And I've been slightly upstaged by our host, hostess, because I was going also to quote Christine Lagarde, a very impressive, I think, head of the IMF. But in her address to the world, sorry, the annual meetings of the Fund and the World Bank, she said this year, or in fact last year, 2012, that, to quote, inequality and the quality of growth in our future world is one of my top priorities. This is the human dimension of policy making. Growth, she said, is essential for a future economy, but it must be a different kind of growth, a growth that's not simply the fallout from unfettered globalization, a growth that is inclusive. And she went on to say that IMF research has shown that less inequality is associated with greater macroeconomic stability and more sustainable economies. Now, this is not the kind of statement that we've heard very often from the head of the IMF. And I've quoted it because my admiration for Christine Lagarde, but also because her remarks capture the first point I want to make in these introductory remarks. This is that there are two reasons for being concerned about inequality, or at least two reasons, but two different reasons. The first is that we feel that a good society is one which doesn't have excessive inequalities. And just to avoid any misunderstanding, I'm not saying that a good society is one where everyone is exactly the same, but that there should not be too much inequality. Now, of course, how much is too much is something which we'll probably can debate this evening. But certainly expressed in terms of pay, Many people, I think, feel that it's not fair in the United Kingdom that the average leading CEO, chief executive, is paid 200 times as much as the average worker, or 400 times the minimum wage. One can understand why they may be paid more, but 400 times seems to many people excessive. After all, Plato, 
in the laws said that the ratio should not exceed four to one, not 400 to one. Or put in terms of growth, why should the top 1% in Britain have received a third of all of the growth that's taken place in incomes in recent decades? The bottom 99% may reasonably feel that they've left, been left behind. And they may ask why the poverty rate in Britain today is twice as high as in the 1960s. The second reason for concern about inequality is that it has bad effects. Christine Lagarde referred to instability in the economy. This is an instrumental concern. And it was the thrust of a book recently which has been read very widely around the world by Richard Wilkinson and Kate Pickett called the spirit level. And they argue that many social ills are associated with greater inequality. For example, people in more unequal societies are more likely to use illegal drugs, to be obese, to commit crimes, or to score badly in educational tests like the PISA and other international comparisons. And indeed, if you look at their graphs in their book, say the one for educational scores, then you find Austria in the middle, close to Germany. And not surprisingly, the Nordic countries score better and have less income inequality. And the US and Portugal score worse and have higher inequality. But at the same time, looking at their graph, I couldn't help noticing that quite a lot of countries are more unequal than Austria and yet score better. France, Switzerland, Canada and Australia. And this, of course, is a weakness of the instrumental argument. If it were the case that there isn't a link between inequality and these social ills, then on this basis, we shouldn't be concerned about inequality. So if we can deal with obesity by some other means, then it doesn't provide a reason for seeking social justice. And that's why in my work on this, I have felt that the first reason is more important and is the one to which we should give priority. The first reason being the questions of inequality are issues of social justice and fairness. If at the same time, by reducing inequality, we can deal with other social problems, that's obviously very good news, but I don't think it should be the main reason why we're concerned with inequality. Now, I've talked just now about income inequality, and this brings me to the second introductory point. Inequality means many different things. And most people are concerned with inequality in some form or another. For example, most people today think that one person, one vote is the right basis for a democracy. And that any unequal access to voting would be regarded as unacceptable. So there are clearly issues of equality in front of politics, in front of the law, which are not what I'm going to be talking about this evening. They're not the focus we have here, but that clearly there are issues of inequality which are much wider than economic inequality, which is what I want to focus on here. Now, in terms of economic inequality, that, of course, has many meanings. For example, and I'm sure this will come up in the discussion, we may be concerned with inequality of opportunity or we may be concerned with inequality of outcomes. That is, inequality of opportunity is concerned about people's life chances, how much we have a level playing field so everyone has the same possibilities to develop their potential. 
outcomes are concerned with what actually happens to them as they go through life. And that, of course, is different, although these two are closely related, and I'm sure we can talk about those. But even in terms simply of outcomes, there are many possibilities. And if I were to ask you, looking around the room, you know, what are your economic circumstances? Well, you would probably say, for example, you might say, I earn so many euros a month. Or my pension is so many euros a month. And that's clearly very important. In fact, talking in this hall, I could hardly say anything otherwise. It clearly, earnings, wages, salaries, and pensions and other benefits are very important. But it's only, that's only part of the story. Of course, inequality is not just that one person's paid a lot more than someone else. Because a household's economic circumstances clearly depend on, for example, who lives in the household. So it depends very much who your partner is, what he or she earns. So the household position is not just looking at the distribution of wages, although that's very important. It's looking at how those get combined to determine the living standards of a household. And that li those living standards depend not just on wages, but also, of course, on income from capital, income from transfers like pensions, unemployment benefit, child benefits, disability benefits, and so on. So there are several different things we might be talking about. And at various stages, we may need to distinguish between talking about wages, earnings, on one hand, and talking about total incomes on the other side. Then when you've answered the question, you know, what are your economic circumstances, what do we do about it? What, how do we then think about the inequality? There was a, a well-known and quite tall Dutch economist. I say he's quite tall because Jan Penn, once in a book on income distribution, envisaged a parade where everyone in a society was either stretched or shrunk so that their height reflected their income. So a person on 20, say 20,000 euros a month, a household on 20,000 euro, euros a month, would be 1 meter 78 or whatever. Well, that's, that's the male height. Uh, I discovered incidentally that Austrians are three centimetres taller than, on average, than British people are. But I, I don't know how you explain that, but anyway. So you have the average person, you have a person then on the poverty line, the European poverty line, would be just about a metre tall. And then, if you imagine this parade, looking at the whole population in order of their incomes, you then get towards the top, and say when you get to the top 10%, how high are they? Any offers? <laughs> They're not very tall. They're actually about three meters. And that, of course, is something people often forget. They often think of the top 10% as people who are really well off. I mean, a long way up. But in fact, the top 10% itself is very unequal. And it's one of the things about the distribution. Whatever group you look at within that group, there's a lot of inequality. Even if you've got a club of billionaires together, some of them have got many times what the others have got. And indeed, I was looking at figures for the um, Austrian CEOs. It was rather out of date, but it relates to 2006. But on that basis, I see there are some people in this country who are about 250 meters tall. Now, I sketch this parade because one of the questions I want you to think about is which bit of this parade do we really, are we really concerned about? And I think that for many people, myself included, I'm very concerned with what's happening at the bottom. And I think that that's a widely, I think, now accepted. And indeed, it's part of the Europe 2020 agenda. I think one of the 
very good things that the European Union has done in the last few years. And of course, you may think it's somewhat strange to hear someone from the United Kingdom <laughs> talking about uh, how good the European Union is. But I think one of the good things that's been done, unfortunately now it's disappeared a bit in the background, is to set out the Europe 2020 objectives, which deal with sustainability of growth, they deal with questions to do with education. But one of the five principal objectives, as you probably know, is to combat poverty and social exclusion. And that is an issue for all European member states. In Austria, an eighth of the Austrian population are living below the income poverty line, risk of poverty line set by the European Union. Lower than the United Kingdom, where the figure is 16%, compared to 12.6% here. Now, I think that should be one major concern, but it's not the only concern. And I think that's one reason why, in recent years, a lot of attention is focused not just on that, but also on the relationship between the population as a whole and the relationship of the people at the very top. And that's why, particularly in the United States, where the top income groups have been racing, racing away, and the share of the top 1% of income receivers in the United States used to be about 8% which meant they had eight times their proportionate share, and is now about getting on for 20%. So it's 20 times. As a fifth, nearly a fifth of total income, household incomes, are going to 1% of the population. This brings me to my third and final point. People are obviously concerned about rising inequality. And there's quite a lot of pessimism I think there's a sense of inevitability that we're somehow, because of possibly globalization, possibly technical change, we're simply moving to a world which is going to be more unequal than we've known in the last 50 years or so. But I think that picture isn't, is perhaps too gloomy. There are some respects in which distribution is changing in the direction of reducing inequality. Notably, at a world level, and I haven't said anything so far about the global distribution, we are seeing something of a narrowing of the gap. The gap that opened up because of the Industrial Revolution when the OECD countries industrialized, the big gap that opened up between, say, Britain and India. And I was at a talk given by the Indian Prime Minister a few years ago, who was one of our students from Nuffield College, and he said, you have to remember that in the beginning of the 18th century, the income gap between Britain and India was something like twice or three times, whereas now it's 10 or 15 times. Things weren't so very different before the Industrial Revolution. And I think we are beginning to see a change. So, for example, in the last four years, when the Austrian economy grew at 2.7%, which by European standards is quite impressive, in that same four years, Ghana grew at 14.4%, China at 9.3%, India at 6.9%, Bangladesh at 6.7%, and Chile at 6%. And at the same time, I mentioned Chile, in areas of the world where inequality has been historically very high, and Latin America is a good example, there are some signs that in some of those countries, like Brazil, for example, that inequality is being reduced from a very high level. So I think not all the signs necessarily are negative. And also I think it's important to bear in mind that in the past we have had sustained periods when inequality in OECD countries has been significantly reduced. The top income share has indeed fallen for much of the 20th century in most countries. And that reflected the impact of progressive 
income and wealth taxation. It also reflected, in terms of reducing poverty, the extension of the welfare state and social protection. These policies did have an effect. And one can't help thinking that one reason for the present increase in inequality is that we've abandoned or cut back the very measures which were used to try and keep inequality in check. So I think the last thing I want to say by way of this introduction is that inequality in incomes and economic circumstances isn't some natural phenomenon over which we have no control. If we want to see a more just society, then it is in our hands. If we're concerned about inequality, then we can do something. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Make yourself at home. <laughs> I'll try. <laughs> so, you obviously, as you said right now, focused on a topic long before it became a sexy topic. Um, yesterday, Barack Obama was talking uh, about it in his inauguration speech. He said, We, the people, understand that our country cannot succeed when a shrinking few do very well and a growing many can barely make it. We believe that, American, that America's prosperity must rest upon the shoulders of a rising middle class. So nowadays, as you said already, uh, income distribution and inequality are topics that everybody talks about. Um, do you, how do you feel about that? Do you think that's a good thing? <laughs> yes. Um, you put the question very nicely, in the sense that you could have said, I've been working on this for 45 years, and things have only got worse. And <laughs> <laughs> so, yes. Um, but they haven't only got worse in the first no, last 45 years. That's not true, is it? No, that's quite true, yes, indeed. Okay. We're, we're, we're worse off than when I began, shall we say. <laughs> I think also the, the Obama re-election, of course, is itself an interesting issue in the sense that inequality clearly played a role in the American election. Uh, and I refer to instrumental reasons why we should concern about inequality. One of those very important reasons is, of course, that uh, the role of money in politics... You don't only mean the 47% sentence that uh, no, Mitt Romney said. <laughs> that was, uh, the, the candidate was partly responsible. But I think that uh, the fact that, uh, if I remember correctly, the, uh, the candidate spent much similar amounts of money, but they came from very different numbers of people. That you is, mean Obama now? Uh, yeah, yes. Uh, Obama spent much yes. the same amount of money as, as the Republican. Uh, it was more candidate. or less the same, but from from. And it came very from many, key, many. Yeah. But of course, that in a sense was showed that as were large political donors, particularly the way the American law works, um, can be their, their impact can be offset. But I think it's also a warning to us that uh, a candidate less charismatic than President Obama. Uh, might well struggle to oppose money in a presidential election. So the first lesson, I think, from the Obama event is that we need to be very concerned about the role of money in politics. So uh, when you started working uh, and researching on income distribution, did your environment call you a weird person or a radical left-winged person? Was that an issue? Yes, um, I mean, I certainly felt, I mean, I, I, partly a, a choice. I was keen to, as it were, write about things. I, I didn't only write about inequality. So I also wrote about economic growth and other things which were more within the mainstream. And, and indeed, uh, public economics, public finance is very much a mainstream subject. Um, I also, though, became very aware of the extent to which uh, one had in studying a subject as sensitive as inequality, you had to be very careful, uh, and even more careful than you might otherwise be, to get things right. Mm 
And I certainly was subject to a quite extensive attack, in fact, a book-length attack for work I did on the distribution of wealth in Britain in the early 1970s. And I thought afterwards my critics had some reasonable points. And I think it was, had a definite effect on my subsequent work that I actually since then have tried to be extremely careful to uh, think th things through and to make sure that I had a, a, understood the subject in sufficient depth to be confident about what I was saying. In what way were those criticisms, uh, critics right? You, in the sense that you were uh, too political and too little economic? No, I think it's more to do with taking um, figures, statistics at face okay. value. And, and you need to probe more carefully. Where I think that's one thing I always tell my students, essentially. You shouldn't just believe a number because someone is in some report or other. There is always like uh, one group of economics that say we need more, we need austerity. The other group says, no, we need to invest The first group says uh, we need more equality. The other group says, well, inequality isn't that big of a deal and it does have positive sides. And in politics, you're either left-winged or right-winged. Is, is there such a thing with economists? Are there only right- and left-winged economists? Yes, I think uh, it's particularly true in the United States. Um, I was... This was brought home to me when I was served on a committee of the National Academy of Sciences. And someone who was setting up this committee was going around talking to potential members. And one of them told me he saw this man's notepad and it had against each name R or D. And I guess my name had a question mark. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that is... Uh, Very overt, and when I was teaching in Harvard, I was just struck. One knew which professor was a Republican, which was a Democrat. And I don't think that's so true in, in, in Britain. And I think also it's fair to say that some of these issues, I think there are many people I would regard as uh, on the right who are actually strongly opposed to the austerity measures, for example. They oppose uh, yes, the austerity measures? Yes, I think measures. that they feel that that's... That they, they feel that they've... Enough uh, of austerity now. Yes, I think, like as I do, I think that we're, we're somehow repeating the mistakes of the 19, early 1930s. Let me get into deeper into that um, into that topic. How much is economics something that you have to do politically? And uh, I'm quoting someone you quoted. Uh, John Broom, he wrote in 2009, economics is a branch of ethics. At least much of it is. Parts of economics is pure science, but most economists are interested in economic science because they're interested in finding better ways of running the economy. Yes, I, I agree partly with, with John Broom about this. Uh, my own view is that economists need... I, mean, I, I, I think that... Um, and, uh, Economics uh, used to be in Cambridge part of the what's called the moral sciences tripos. And I think that economics is a moral science in the sense that it should be concerned with understanding the implications of different moral judgments. So I think it's perfectly acceptable for people to say, well, I'm not going to tell you whether you should be concerned, say, about the bottom of the distribution or the top of the distribution. But if you are concerned about the bottom of the distribution, then this follows. So that's your way of being a scientist and not a yeah. moral person. Yeah, I, I, clearly in my personal life, I have a moral, more moral values than I follow. But as, as an economist, it seems to me to explore the implications of different moral judgments is an important thing to do. And if you don't do that, of course, you end up very often, which I think much of economics does, of implicitly making moral judgments, but without examining them. So behind much of the use of words like efficient or uh, optimal or improving is some hidden moral judgment. And I think that's, very, that's what we shouldn't be doing. We should be making those explicit there. I fully agree with John Broom that actually 
one important job of economists and teaching economics. We should teach people to actually say, well, what exactly is the ethical basis for the statement you just made? The European Central, the European Central Bank uh, is researching on wealth, which is not so easy to do. Um, but they also ask people, how do they feel? Do they feel poor? Do they feel rich? Do they feel in the middle? And more or less everybody says, well, I'm middle class. So who is really rich, who's poor, who's in the middle? Right. <laughs> yes. Um, is that something you can only, like, being compared to someone else? Or, or can, you, can you say, well, if you earn this and that, if you have this and that, then you are rich or then you are poor? Yeah, I think... Let me start with the defining the poverty. Uh, of course, obviously, we do this. I, mean, we, I referred to the Europe 2020 objective. That is a measure which is concerned with poverty in, mem in European member states. Now, the notion that has been adopted, and I think has a fairly wide degree of support, but people here may disagree, is that poverty is in a rich society, or like... Austria or the United Kingdom, is about people not being able to take part fully in the life of the society in which they live. That is, for example, not being able to compete effectively for a job. And that means that it is relative to other people. So you can't define it in so many euros now and expect the same to apply 20 or 30 years' time. So a good example is that Nowadays, it's probably very difficult for someone uh, who's trying to get a job who hasn't got a, a mobile phone. <laughs> There's a sign. <laughs> Thank you. Right. Here we go. <laughs> uh, without, if, you, if you've got a job offer, I should take it. Uh, <laughs> um, 20 years ago, we wouldn't have been that. So to say now that people have to be able to afford a, a telephone or whatever is a relatively is a relative poverty measure which makes to my mind quite a lot of sense because what you're trying to do is to make sure people are not excluded from taking part in activities like getting a job or their children taking part fully in school and so on. again having a computer at home is now increasingly very important for children to keep up with their work at school that wouldn't have been true even 10 years ago so I think the poverty line is something which we can talk about. Whether it's drawn correctly at the present level or not, we can debate. It could be lower or higher. But I think that principle for doing it makes a lot of sense. And I suppose at the other end of the scale, you might say that people who are so rich that they can actually voluntarily exclude themselves from society is a way of defining what's meant by rich. That is, people who, for example... Uh, are able to dispense with the need for the police or protection services, their, their own private protection services, for instance. Now, those people are people who are opting out of so society. So people living in gated communities gated, are rich? Gated communities, yes. I mean, I th not necessarily, but it's the kind of indication. Mm -hmm. I, I, I wouldn't say everyone living in a gated community is rich, because mm -hmm. I suspect that's, that would be absurd. But I think that something along those lines, when I was talking about distance, it's that. I think that's the sort of notion... So it can only be relative to others. Yes, because obviously many of the things that are, for example, like protection, um, like opting out of the health service or out of education, having a private tutor rather than going to school, all of these depend on the cost of employing people. So it makes it relative. Inequality is measured with the Gini coefficient or with the Atkinson Index, which is named after you. Uh, what's the difference? Uh, Gini was a very distinguished Italian statistician. Uh, I'm an English economist. I think that uh, <laughs> I think there's a crucial difference in a way, and that the reason why I suggested another way of looking at it was. That the Gini coefficient is a statistical measure, and it tells you that the Gini coefficient in Austria is 26%. I'm <laughs> that right, right? And that's what you read in the statistical abstracts, uh, annuals, and so on. 
Now, what does that mean? Now, the problem with it is, of course, it embodies some values about what the distribution of income ought to look like. And so the, what I suggested instead was to have a way which actually allowed people to themselves decide how much weight to give to people at different points in the income distribution. So there isn't a single value of this index. It depends on something you have to choose, a parameter, a number you have to choose. And depending on what you choose, you could, for example, say, I don't care about inequality at all. So we simply look at total incomes. Or, at the other extreme, you could say, I only care about the worst off people, which is what John Rawls and some versions suggested as a philosopher, and, or anything in between. And so this is the idea of doing it. It's an idea which, quite frankly, didn't succeed. So and in the sense that it's, people don't like making that choice. But you could choose to look at only the top Yeah. The richest people, for example, in Austria, or also focus on the lowest the, at, the, at the bottom, let's yeah. say 10% in Austria. So you could focus really and, and dig deeper than with the Gini coefficient. Yes, indeed. But of course, what it does do is to allow you to look at the whole distribution, not just the, one, the top or the bottom. Right. Yeah. right. So you already said before that you were concerned about the gap between the rich and the poor. Um, but there are a lot of economists who say, well, it's good, it's a good motivation for the poor to see how well off rich people are and they have an orientation, if they work harder, they can get there. That's still, a lot of economists see it that way. Do you argue with them? And if you do, what do you say? Yeah, I think, well, there are several things um, compounded in that. Uh, One is, of course, it's usually used as an argument about whether, uh, how far one should uh, tax people and how far that acts as a disincentive. How far um, the existence of uh, successful people acts as a stimulus to people who are to, to for example, go into particular uh, occupations or to take risks and so on. And that clearly, I think that must be an important element. But the question is how far it's the financial rewards associated with that success that provides that stimulus is a much more difficult question and that's one where I would take issue with. I suspect from reading uh, life histories, uh, industrial histories of people who've contributed a great deal in particular fields, lead, reading lives of scientists and so on, one suspects that money played some role but It's only a rather minor part of their motivation. And so one suspects that at least the people who have been successful in the past, that if they go, it isn't going for the money that's made them what they are. How come you focus on inequality in material income? If you want to focus on inequality, there would be a lot of other topics like human capital or education. Why is it material income? Oh, I think that's quite right. I fully agree that this is just one dimension. Uh, I mean, you could look also look at people, people's wealth as well as their income. That's a very important We'll issue. talk about that a bit later. Right, okay. But no, no, I, I fully agree. I'm not in any sense suggesting this is the only thing one needs to look at. I, I think that uh, I, I've strongly supported, for example, at the European level, work on multi-dimensional approaches to uh, measuring particularly deprivation, because I think there it is indeed very much a concern. I mean, essentially, it's sort of people who are very deprived who may have a fair amount of, of cash income, but they're living in very poor housing for various reasons, or they have poor... Uh, medical services or other reasons which are much more important than money. So I, I, would, I think that's absolutely right. But nonetheless, money is still not as important. <laughs> I, I think I wouldn't go to the other extreme of saying that um, as some of the people who argue for looking at subjective well-being and happiness, they're actually disregarding money. And money is still very important. Because it's also something you can measure easily, right? Yes, I mean, that's, that's true. Although you can measure bad housing and you can measure yes. people's medical situation and so on. So, no, no, I, 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 I see it as part of a, a range of things we should be looking at. Mm -hmm. 
in whole Europe, but in, in Austria especially, there we have still, I don't, but a lot of other people do have memories of the Eastern Bloc, and they come up as soon as we talk about equality. Uh, hasn't socialism shown that equality is not better than inequality? That, like, as you said before, like, complete equality is not what we want, or is not what you want anyway. Um, so how equal... How equal shall we be in, an, in a society? How equal is it good to be in a society? Right, okay. Uh, well, first of all, on the East, uh, the, the Soviets and Eastern Europe, I, mean, I think they did not uh, pursue a particularly sort of redistributive policy. I mean, I think uh, I, I did it at the time of 1990 when the wall came down and so on. I, I did a study of inequality and poverty in the Soviet Union, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Poland. Uh, and it was quite interesting because it revealed, first of all, there was quite a lot of concern in these countries, which was not published at the time. We got access to unpublished materials which showing there were studies of poverty, particularly in, in uh, Czechoslovak and uh, in Poland. At the same time, and it was also the Soviet Union was not at all uh, I mean, egalitarian, and uh, probably inequality, as far as one can tell, was probably at least as high as in most Western countries. Like the animal farm from George Orwell, yeah. some animals were more Indeed, equal yes. than others. Yeah. On the other hand, in, in Czechoslovakia, they certainly did succeed in reducing wage differentials a lot. They also succeeded in reducing regional differentials a lot. So there were some countries that did actually do quite a lot in that. So it, was an, it wasn't a homogeneous pattern. So I think one shouldn't just say that was, um, that was the Soviet bloc and it was all the same. And I think in some respects, uh, clearly they were, in terms of educational levels and other things, quite successful in Eastern Europe. How much inequality there should be? I think that's a very difficult question. I just feel that the changes that have been in the recent years have moved us to a range where I feel they are excessive. And so I think at the moment, the direction is, we've gone too far in that direction. With the recent years, you mean since the 1980s? Yes, I think that's sort of, yeah. Um, how has it changed? If you take the last hundred years, we could say things got better, right? If you take the last 30, 40 years, you could say things have gotten worse. Yes, I think that's broadly right, yes. I think. <laughs> <laughs> that's a quite short answer. <laughs> well, to amplify slightly, I mean, I think it, as far as the top is concerned, we're back more or less to the uh, sort of pre 1930s kind of situation. I, we haven't, I'm glad to say, so far, although we've yet to see what's going to happen particularly with the austerity measures, uh, the, the rates of, of poverty, the kind of things we saw in the 1930s have not yet reappeared. But we're seeing really quite serious cuts in welfare payments in the United Kingdom, which I think are really quite alarming. Uh, the economist John Kenneth Galbraith uh, has written about the economic crisis in the 1930s. You already said that oh. you are reminded our austerity measures remind you of that time. Uh, he claimed that the crisis was the consequence of the big gap between rich and the poor. Do you agree? Yes. Uh, he's wrote this wonderful book, which you haven't, anyone hasn't read it. It's called The Great Crash, which is a really, I think, I mean, he writes brilliantly, and this is a really, really interesting book. It's a very interesting things in it. Uh, he tells a somewhat sad story in the introduction, which uh, that um, the day it was published, the stock market fell quite substantially in the United States. This is in the 1950s, which is a result of which he received many death threats and other things, which uh, he decided he was perhaps not wise to write about the Great Crash. Now, the, of course, we've had quite a lot of financial crises. The 1929 financial crisis in the United States certainly followed a period when inequality increased. The 1920s were really a period of substantial increase in inequality. 
And since, from 1929 till, say, after the Second World War, inequality certainly fell. Now, with a student... But is, but is, there a, is, is it related? Is the big gap before the crisis, before 1929, related to the crisis? Yeah, well, I, was, I was going to come to that. Oh, sorry. Right. No, because I was going to say, <laughs> in answering that question, we then wanted to look at other crises. And with a student in Oxford called Salvatore Morelli, we've been looking at all of the financial crises that took place in the last 100 years in 25 countries. And there are many of these crises. One interesting feature, which is partly related to your, answering your question, is, of course, if you look at them over time, you discover that there were a lot of crises up to 1939. There's then a long gap until about 1980. There was about one or two crises, one in Brazil, I think, if I remember rightly. Then after that, there were lots of crises. So we had quite a long period where there were very few economic crises. Now, that was also a period when inequality was both was certainly falling and was uh, reached a low level. Now, but it also that it illustrates the difficulty in answering your question, because it is true that we've had more crises since then, and it's time when inequality has been rising. But, of course, that doesn't necessarily say those two things are connected. And my own view is probably that it was as much that these two were the result of the political changes that took place in Anglo-Saxon countries at that time, which in turn led to things like deregulation of the financial markets, which contributed to the crises. And to say it was inequality, it may just be that the inequality was also a result of that same policies rather than necessarily the inequality which was causing it. And during the crisis? Well, of course, recent crises are, in fact, rather different from 1929 uh, in the sense that, as far as one can see, uh, there was a modest fall in the shares of top incomes following the most recent crisis, which has, to some extent, been reversed recently. And not much change elsewhere so far in the distribution. And I think that shows two things. One is that actually, in contrast to 1929, in both the United States and in Europe, our safety nets, our automatic stabilizers, actually worked quite well following the recent crisis. And it's a little known fact, which I'm afraid our governments did nothing to publicize, but if you look at what happened to household incomes, following 2008, when production fell by 6-7% across the Eurozone. There was this dramatic fall in production. Household incomes did not fall until about 2010. They hadn't risen with the boom. So if you imagine household incomes going like this, and national income went up and then it went down, but the automatic effects of social protection, unemployment benefits, other benefits, pensions, the effects of taxes actually had the effect of cushioning the effects on household incomes until about 2010, 2011. In Europe? In Europe, yeah. And so I think we should mark that as a success of the kind of welfare state tax measures that were put into place following the Second World War, unlike 1929. Now, of course, this is now at risk because those measures had their cost and that led to the problems with the government budgets, which is now meaning those same protection devices are being scaled back and cut back. So I think we're now at risk. But it's not the crisis as such which has caused this as the reactions to the crisis afterwards. There is the Global Risk Report, Risks Report, um, and it just came out a couple of days ago. It lists the 50 risks for this world, and the top risk is the gap between the rich and the poor. Mm -hmm. The second risk uh, that is listed is the public deficit. <laughs> oh, yeah. right, the same report yeah. did not mention inequality as a global risk, 
uh, in the years from 2008 to 2010. Hmm. So that really supports what you were just saying. Um, hmm. But how do, you, how do you work with those, those two risks? You just said that's going to be a problem in the future. It is, it is becoming a problem already. How do you work with that? I mean, clearly, I mean, uh, these two are in tension. On the other hand, of course, it's very important to bear in mind that there's more than one way to deal with a deficit. And we often talk as though deficit austerity measures and so on are inevitable. But of course, there's a lot of choice about the form of those measures. And again, it <laughs> reverts to the point I made earlier about implicit values. There's a lot of implicit judgments being made in saying that we have to follow this particular policy. And that includes the recommendations of, of international bodies as well as national governments. My own view is that you therefore need to try and reconcile these two uh, risks by designing the fiscal adjustment. And I do agree we, do, we need a fiscal adjustment but designing it in such a way as to reduce the adverse effect on inequality, which probably means more weight on tax increases and less on expenditure reductions, for example. And we have roughly sort of 80% spending cuts and 20% tax increases on average across countries. That ratio in itself is probably is causing difficulties. Uh, in the sense that much of the spending cuts are falling on people uh, on low incomes. Not all, but many of them are. So I think the first thing to do then is to think about the structure of your austerity programs and within the spending cuts to think about who are the people who are affected by those. And again, I think we've seen there a, in my view, over harsh reduction in spending on young people and families and less reduction on spending for people like me. So now we're talking about the inequality between the old and the young, yeah. which is another big theme, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think the I mean, these issues of intergenerational equity and just listing the... Well, I'm talking obviously mostly I know about the United Kingdom, but the cuts in, for example, early years programs, Sure Start, which are for pre-three-year-olds, uh, in nursery provision, in childcare provision, cutting educational budgets, cutting programs to allow people to stay on at school, raising student fees. <laughs> We're just working through cutting back child benefit. These are all heavily concentrated on families and their children. I just read this article the other day. It was, I think, last week in, in an Austrian newspaper. And uh, it said that inequality... Uh, is only as big as we measure it because we don't distinguish between full-time jobs and part-time jobs. And they, got mixed, they get mixed together, and that's why, of course, people earn less in part-time jobs than in full-time jobs, and that's why you get the impression that actually it's more unequal in Austria than it is. Well, if you look simply... I agree, if you look at people and look at their earnings and don't take account of how many hours they work, then you're going to get a misleading picture. Yeah, that's, that's certainly true. But I, I suspect most serious analysts of earnings will actually make that correction. And certainly all of the figures on, that I've used on earnings differences are about looking at people who are working full-time or adjusted for the hours they work. Talking about part-time jobs, uh, there should be some good news that you could tell us. Uh, the distribution between men and women, that has yes. gotten better, hasn't it? Well, yes. Uh, it, certainly over quite a long period, the, in, in quite a number of countries, the differential narrowed, but it seems to have stalled. Uh, so I think progress has been quite slow in recent years. And... In, I've seen a study, for example, for Sweden, which suggests, if anything, the glass ceiling at the top of the energy distribution has become, if anything, harder to penetrate than it was in the past. And, for example, in England, it's very noticeable that we have now fewer 
for example, we have very few women in the cabinet, for example. We have fewer women in senior positions in the civil service than we have. We have very few chief executives of women. So I think that's, I, I think the gender issue is still very much with us. And I think also, that again, the effects of the austerity measures is again bearing more heavily on women in a number of respects. So I think, I, I'm afraid I'm, I'm quite concerned about this. You mentioned Richard Wilkinson and Kate Pickett before. Um, they have compared only rich countries in their book um, on the basis, as you said, on, of so social parameters and all the stuff we don't want. So obesity, people in prison, teenager pregnancies, infant mortality. Um, and their conclusion is the bigger the gap, the likelier the bad stuff shows up. Um, for everybody but the one top percent. And you raised the question, and I'm going to ask you, why is Austria in the middle and still worse off than other countries, as you, as you said before? Yes, I, I, was, I picked on Austria because I'm here. Because you're here, yeah. Uh, but uh, I wasn't picking on Austria because it was, in a sense, uh, uh, different. I, what I was, the point I was trying to make was that they produce interesting evidence, but when you look at this evidence, there is some sort of association, but it's not a, by any means uh, uh, as convincing as perhaps one would like it to be. So that there are, there's a kind of a scatter of points. So you cannot confirm what they, uh, their research? I think that, well, to begin with, I think anyone investigating any serious or in any phenomenon like obesity crime and so on, would probably expect there to be several things affecting it. So you would, I think, at the very least, if you were trying to explain these important social uh, factors, you would say, I want to look at not just at income inequality, but other things too. And I think that's the essential first step in doing it, which they don't take. They just simply have you, they have one variable and another variable, and they look at the relationship between them. I'm afraid that's, it certainly makes one think, but to be more definite about it, I think one needs to look carefully at each of the individual problems that they study and ask, are there other things going on which may be causing both of the things? So it may be a situation where income inequality and obesity are actually due to the same third factor which we mm. haven't identified. Well, that bad health and, 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 and yep. uh, being poor obviously relates, for example. Exactly. Yeah. These two things are interconnected. Rather, yeah. Yeah. So what other areas, you have spoken about it, uh, uh, what other areas does inequality affect? Uh, we did talk about the social and the health aspects. Uh, how about economic growth? Does, does inequality boost or lower economic growth? I've, my own, I, I think no one really understands economic growth. So that's the first point. And it's actually very difficult to explain. I mean, I think that on the one hand, if you look at countries in, say, OECD countries over the post-war period, with a few exceptions, they've grown at very similar rates. I mean, for example, there have been periods possibly decades when the United States has grown faster, like in the 1990s. But that followed a period when the United States was growing much more slowly than European countries. And in fact, I think it was about 1989, the Americans had a report saying, if we carry on as we are, we shall end up below Argentina. Now, these growth these changes in growth rates are, don't seem to be very permanent. As I said, if you take, say, 1950 and today, countries are ranked in very similar ways, with a few exceptions. I mean, there are some countries, like Spain has grown very fast, for example. Ireland at one time grew very fast, but of course Ireland has grown less fast recently. So, so my feeling is that if there was a clear connection between growth rates and something else, some other difference, it would show up by now in these countries. Now, of course, I'm not saying this is the same explaining the difference between China and the OECD, but within the OECD, my guess is that most of the things we talk about probably don't have very much effect on this. 
You already said, if you see the last hundred years, then in Europe things have gotten more equal, and in the last 30 years they've gotten more unequal. But if we um, talk about developing and developed countries, then, like as you said before, Asian countries and India, then the world is getting better, isn't it? Yeah, definitely, yes. So, well, as I said, that's, I think, I mean, it is with the qualification that, of course, some countries are being left behind. Mm. So, in a sense, the position of some of the sub Saharan African countries uh, or equatorial countries is actually um, clearly bit, they're being left behind and may find it harder to compete with successful Asian countries and other ones. So, I'm not saying. It's, It's a total success story, but yes, I think there's no doubt that uh, we've seen the, the, the great sort of transformation, which was the Industrial Revolution, is now spreading quite widely. Compared to other countries, for example, the US, that Joseph Stieglitz wrote his book about, uh, being very concerned about inequality, Austria is very well off. We have little unemployment rates, especially youth unemployment is a lot lower than it is in other European countries. Um, why do you think that is? <laughs> oh, I, I, I hope you will tell me. We're just more productive. We're just lucky. <laughs> yes. Well, you know, being small is probably a help, I suspect, these days. Small must be. I think looking at, there are quite a lot of, I mean, there's Finland, there are quite a lot of small parts of Sweden. They're all relatively small, which, on the other hand, Greece is fairly small too. So I, I, it's... Um, <laughs> <laughs> and we do have a high deficit too, not as high as Greece, yeah. but we do. Yes, oh, and do. in what yeah. way, you said it before, that we can look at deficits mm. and austerity programs in different ways, but, yep. but um, we have to face the deficit, don't we? Yeah, now, I think, I'm, I'm glad you've come back to that, because I, I do want to say, I, I think that we have a fiscal problem. And the fiscal problem is not one of the last few years, it's a fiscal problem of the last 20 or 30 years. Uh, and it comes about because in my view, governments have not been willing to raise taxes sufficiently. And in quite a number of countries, and I don't know about Austria, this has been made possible by the sequence of privatizations which financed tax cuts for a long period, like 20 years. And it's not very popular to raise taxes, right? It's not popular, but I think it's, it's dishonest to pretend that one can have a society with this with the current levels of social protection, current levels of infrastructure and so on, without having taxes. And I think that we, our political leaders have failed us. And I noticed that President Obama did not quote from the building a few yards from where he stood yesterday, which is the office of the Internal Revenue Service, which has on the outside of the building, in letters chiseled in stone, taxes are the price we pay for civilization. And I think that's what, I think that's what our political leaders, somehow they've managed to tell us we don't need to pay taxes. And I think that's been a big mistake. In Austria, we have two point, about 2.4 million people who earn so little money that they don't pay income taxes. Uh, do you have any suggestion how to change that? Well, they're not my first candidates for paying more tax, no. Uh, <laughs> that would be... <laughs> uh, but... I mean, I think the, the question about how we design... I think tax structures... Of course, internationally, we've moved in the European Union to fairly heavy reliance on the value-added tax uh, for various reasons, and that, of course, is being paid by the people you're talking about who are not paying income tax. Uh, Probably we need to think about raising more revenue from income tax, but that does require European or possibly global uh, action. I mean, there's no doubt that taxing is more difficult in a global world, and the kind of ease with which people can move capital and savings around the world. On the other hand, I do think we're beginning to move slowly, for all sorts of reasons, some of them not very good reasons, perhaps, uh, towards a world where we actually may move 
which was much more international coordination of taxation. And I think we've seen that, for example, with the issues to do with bank secrecy in various countries. We've seen it with regard to collaboration or exchange of information between governments. And we've seen it in relation to the beginning of various forms of global taxes. And we touched on global distribution, but my own view is we're going to need to move to having some forms of global taxes, which we already have in, for the funds for HIV and other uh, funds that there are. And I think that the world is moving slowly to a much more collaborative, much more global view of taxation. The gap between incomes in Europe, they've gotten bigger in the last couple of years, you say, but the gap between wealthy and poor people got even bigger than that. Um, so not talking about income, but talking about wealth. How, how come? Yes, yeah, so it is interesting. The, um, going back for a moment to 1929 and the Great Crash, uh, when people were allegedly jumping out of skyscrapers because they'd suddenly lost all their wealth overnight. We've not seen that in the recent crash. In fact, I went back and looked, in preparing for this talk, I went back and looked at the list of billionaires in the world, the Forbes magazine list, uh, in 2006, and compared it to the list which came out uh, last year, in February last year. And in 2012, after the crisis, I went down the list of the first 25, and two of them had died, and one had disappeared. All the rest were in the top, not 25 necessarily, the top 50 or so of that list. And I think only two of them had, had any reduction in their wealth as a result of so the So they know how to keep their money. They know how to keep their money, yeah. And I think that was the difference from 1929, because I think in those days people, uh, shareholders' shares were held by the rich, and those fell a lot. Today, many countries, shares are held not by the rich, but by pension funds and institutions and other bodies. They're held by small savers. Uh, whereas the wealthy have private equity, they have uh, other assets, timber and this sort of thing. And many of them... Real estate. What, sorry? Real estate. Real estate, real estate, yeah. Many of them were also in cash. And Warren Buffett had a lot of cash, which he used to buy... He lent a substantial amount to Goldman Sachs, I seem to remember, and bought a railroad and things. I mean, he was, you know, he was there to buy assets cheaply, so he, he was able to keep his wealth, although well, he's given a lot of it away. You already said that you do think that inequality has an effect on politics, on democracy. Uh, your colleague Joseph Stieglitz says in his uh, new book that the costs of inequality are very high, not only economically, but also politically. Um, the influence and power of wealth on politics, he claims, is too high. Uh, he used to say, and I think you might be saying the same thing, he, he said it used to be one person, one vote, mm. but now it is one dollar, one vote. Mm. Um, and of course, that's a slogan of a very media-experienced person, but <laughs> is it true? <laughs> Well, of course, there's always been a lot of money in American politics. I think the, uh, there was an American senator who, I think in the 1800s, said there are two important things in politics. He said, one is money, and I've forgotten the other one. <laughs> and so it's not new. What's new, of course, is the, the change to have these political action committees, which mean you can't limit the amount given. That's been the big change. And I think that's a reasonable thing. We want to think about regulating uh, the way in which campaign contributions and so on uh, can be made. But also, of course, it reflects, as we see, for example, in Italy, the role of the media and in the United Kingdom as well. So it's not just money being used to fund candidates. It's also money being used to influence opinion. And yes, I think it's true that this is uh, clearly a way in which people with very large amounts of money are able to have a substantial influence on the outcomes of elections. 
How do you think we did talk a little bit about the austerity, um, uh, how you could manage austerity differently, but how do you think politics should react on the now increasing uh, gap between rich and poor? Um, you said that taxation is one thing that you think is important to do. Um, the regulation of financial markets, maybe, education, growth. Any recipes? Yes, I think, well, could I start at the European level? Sure. I think that one of the sort of sad things about the recent discussions about crises and steps that have been taken is that we've only essentially followed one path. We've concentrated on the Eurozone, the problems about the uh, bond markets in different countries. And that's clearly, that has to be a major focus in terms of short-run crisis management. But I think it's very sad at the same time that we haven't had a second tier of, a second line of policy, which is at the same time saying we have to keep in mind what we're trying to do in the longer or in the medium term. And that's why I think the first thing the European Union should be doing is to say to people, we are urging member states to carry out various fiscal austerity policies, but at the same time, we are not giving up on our longer-term goals and particularly the kind of things in the Europe 2020 agenda. So I think what I would like to see at the European level is actually some concrete, positive suggestions under that heading. And just to give you two which fall in the field of social protection, one is that they're beginning to talk about, but very hesitantly, it's in the, the roadmap of a European-wide unemployment benefit. On Wouldn't that lower it for countries like Austria? No, no, no. I think, it is, yeah, I can see that's, that, that was the Massachusetts argument against health care reform. <laughs> uh, yeah, clearly one ha it has to be something which is an, Im an improvement. So it would be, and it might well be... Well, it would be improvement for a lot of countries, but not for Austria, maybe. Well, no, but I, I, I don't know if someone in the audience can probably tell me I mean, how many people in Austria don't get unemployment benefit. I mean, in Europe, the European Union as a whole, about 40% of people who are unemployed for more than six months don't receive any unemployment benefit, for example. Now, it may be in Austria it's zero, but I, and I, have to, I haven't got the table with me, well, I can't are. check, but... There it, are some, but if, if anybody knows in this room... Then it's then not, later it's not on, you could tell me. <laughs> so I think that maybe it, it won't help Austria, but, the, but of course that is, that's part of the European Union, in a sense, is, is trying to bring everyone up to high standards. And of course, with growth rates of 2.7%, you don't necessarily need a stimulus in the same way other countries mm. do. So a European unemployment benefit would be an example, which would then set, as were, a minimum standard, which other countries can clearly exceed. So the Austrian case wouldn't, wouldn't be damaged in any way, but it would be clearly be, be uh, and would provide for a very substantial number of people. After all, there are a very large number of people unemployed in Europe today. 20-something million, 25 million. It's a very big problem. The second suggestion I have is since I'm concerned about intergenerational justice and the effects of austerity measures, is a European basic income for children. Now, again, in Austria, you may not, that may not, you may well provide a benefit above what that would be. But requiring every member state to provide a basic income for children at a certain proportion of the average incomes in those countries. Now, that kind of European program would, I think, be a signal of, of the seriousness about Europe trying to achieve its objectives. It would also be a substantial contribution in terms of the uh, stabilization and growth of, those, of quite a number of economies. And then 
I could move on to as well the national level. But Till they're 18, or, or how, for how long? Oh, the, the basic, yes, to some age, yeah. We'd have to agree on whatever, probably to 18. Yes. I have to move back to the, to the unemployment mm. money you want to give European-wide. Would that like, be on top of the measures that every country has already, or instead of? No, I think it would clearly be, for example, uh, one thing it might, well, I should say, by the way, that this is not a new idea. This was actually proposed in the report prior to the euro being established in 1975. It was, it was said that if we're introducing a common currency, we have to have some kind of common unemployment benefit. This is 1975. So it's not a new idea. And what has been proposed since then is actually should take one concrete form, which is to provide extended benefits. That is, exactly as in the United States, the federal government requires countries to extend their benefits beyond the current period of payment. So, for example, in my country, we pay benefits for a maximum of 26 weeks. After that, there's no unemployment benefit. So what would your suggestion be? A couple so, of years? Or? Yeah, so, yeah, so exactly as President Obama has extended it, I think it's 70-something weeks, 70... I've got a figure in my head. It's, it's of that order. It's a year and a half, I think, the American... One, and it's required of states then to, produce, to, to pay that. Now, mm -hmm. of course, in this case, the European Union may want to make some contribution to it. In Austria, but also in, other Europe, in many other European countries, people say, well, we can't do this or we can't do that, otherwise the financial markets will punish us. That's always an argument, for example, regulating financial markets, that was always the argument against it. So can politics actually change anything without being punished by the financial markets? We'll put the other way around. That's a rather sad view of the future of the world, isn't it? If, if essentially we have no way of controlling what is a very small part of the economy. Um, in, I think also one has to bear in mind, of course, that the financial markets may punish uh, countries that are running deficits. They also punish countries that aren't growing very fast. They also punish? But countries that are not growing very fast. And so I think that they're not quite as irrational uh, about this as they may appear. On the other hand, yeah, I, th I do think that um, there is... Uh, it seems to me that, uh, well, I think Keynes talked about the role of the financial markets, and he said that, I'm um, paraphrasing, it's fine for gambling, but the investment decisions of our countries will be ill-served if they're carried out in a casino. And I think that's rather my view of the financial markets. Well, how would you change that? Well, I think, for example, I mean, it, it, it has, Bear in mind, of course, this is very much an Anglo-Saxon, uh, the extent of dominance of um, the uh, financial markets in terms of companies, rather than not talking about governments now, I'm separating the two out. And, of course, there are countries that make it much more difficult for, for example, companies to be taken over uh, and for the kind of short-term considerations to dominate company decision-making. So I think that in terms of the corporate sector, there are quite a number of institutional changes which would reduce the influence of the stock market. If managers, if uh, heads of companies would sit together and say, OK, let's, let's change yeah. our policies. Yes, of course. And I think that there's no doubt that we've seen a shift in the last 20 or 30 years, in, in, again, in Anglo-Saxon countries, from management's which were, had a, a longer-term view of their objectives, partly because the financial rewards to them were heavily taxed. And for many of them, success was less financial than it was achieving the growth and success of their companies. And I think the reduction in the taxation of top incomes, one consequence was that managers then spent more time securing their financial advantage, which now, after tax, was worthwhile to do. And as a result of that, got less of their... They got greedy. Well, I wouldn't say it's greedy, but as they rationally responded to the fact that money now meant more to them, was worth more to them. And as a result of that, I think that's one reason why they became less concerned 
I went, and Galbraith, you mentioned earlier, Galbraith talked in the 1970s about firms being run by people who essentially wanted their, country, their companies to grow. The new industrial estate was about the, these corporations who were wanting to take over the world. Now I think people are concerned more with maximizing their shareholder value because that's what's... Isn't that the same thing? No, not at all, no. I think that uh, you shareholders... Well, you just said to me the financial markets don't recognize that they're the ones that try and get the uh, highest reward now. And, of course, if you're trying to take over the world, that may involve substantial amounts of investment. That is, postponing paying out money to your shareholders. But how do you tell someone who is a manager right now of a big company, we talked about Nestle before, for example, any other big company, um, to change his mind and do it another way? Go back to the old tradition. Well, I think this way goes back to an earlier question when you asked me about um, ethics and economics. And there we were talking about the role of an economist, but I think... You know, we all individually have our ethical principles. Uh, and it seems to me that the issues there to, regarding professional ethics in management, finance, and other areas, individual workers. And there's a very striking account in the early history of Barclays Bank, well known, I suspect, to many of you, uh, where the, I think the founder of Barclays Bank wrote on him when he retired or left the firm to the next generation, said it's more important that our young men should know how to act properly, I forget it was men in those days, that uh, they should know how to act properly than it was for them to make money. And that seems to be rather different from what the current way in which Many banks seem to be run. And I think many people who work in the banking sector will say the same. There's been a shift in professional ethics away from... And I think that's a, an issue which is not something easily dealt with by regulation. It's not something that's dealt with by legislation. I think it does require the kind of shift in public opinion and moral standards. The question I asked you before we came here was... Uh why you don't publish um, books that non-economists would understand. Um, <laughs> and why you don't spread those ideas to the public. Wouldn't that be an idea? Thank you, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, you mentioned Warren Buffett before, and he was, he's one of the very rich people and very few rich people who said, well, tax the rich, please. Mm. Um, but taxing the rich does not always work. You can see it in France right now that rich people, there is even a very well-known, Gérard Depardieu, is only the most striking example. They leave the country. Um, so that can't be good for the economy either, can it? Uh, <laughs> well, I won't comment on Gérard Depardieu. Um, but I think... That does go back to what I said earlier, that it is indeed difficult for Austria, France, or any other country to act on their own. Now, I'm not suggesting we're going to have a tax agreement with Russia very soon, but nonetheless, I think that uh, some form of international agreement is necessary. I should say also that this is not purely from the point of view of taxing people who would leave the country. It's also the fact that international taxation is extremely complex, uh, and I think quite a number of wealthy people would actually welcome having a tax regime which was fixed and global. And actually, we were willing to pay more tax under that regime than they currently do because of the complexity, because of the uncertainties that are created. Because then they know what they're facing. Exactly. I think many of them say, I don't want to spend my life worrying about taxation and whether if I spend an extra day in this country I'm going to acquire an extra tax liability, this sort of thing. I mean, the, the rules are extremely complex. Uh, and so I think that it's been suggested that if we, if we were to agree globally to have a, a world tax regime, perhaps run by the OECD or somebody, which does a lot of work on tax harmonization, or a world tax organization. 
except that WTO is gone. But <laughs> <laughs> we can't have that, but the World Tax Organization, World Fiscal Organization. Um, then we could imagine having a situation where people could, could sort of opt in or whatever, uh, but that would be a way of taxing those who are really genuinely living in several places. Sir Anthony Barnes Atkinson, thank you very much for these last, I think, two hours that we had here. Thank you for coming. And... <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and I'm supposed to say now that... Um, And I'm going to say it in German. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, okay. Sie können uh, das hier nachsehen auf www.wienerstadtgespräch.at und Literatur und DVDs gibt es in der Arbeiterkammer Wien zu finden. Darauf weise ich noch hin und ich wünsche Ihnen einen schönen Abend. Danke fürs Kommen.